said that uh, time doesn't exist, but we seem to, somehow we are stuck in it. And, and you say that space took a, a cyclic turn and that's how the, the, we, we are stuck in time. Uh, is it only our bodies or our mind? What, I mean, how, how is it exactly See, like… right now everybody is sitting here. Let's say we will make them sit here for next ten days just like this. Will they sit? No. Let's say we make them sit here for next three hours. Well, the body will keep time. If you forget also, suppose they're very interested in what we are saying and uh, they forgot time mentally, the bladder will keep time. <laughs> it will tell you when it's three hours for sure, isn't it? Your stomach will keep time. It will tell you when you're hungry and when it's time. So once you're, once you're embodied as a physical being, time is an essential factor of your life. And you know in your experience, time is a relative experience, but in your body it is not so. It is keeping time all the time because body is just a product of this planet and it keeps time. Right now, what is your idea of time? Planet spins like this, it's one day. Moon goes around, that's one month. Planet goes around the sun, that's one year. All our ideas of time is only because of the cyclical movement of physical nature. This is the nature of physicality. Physicality is always happening in cyclical moments. Whether it's an atom or the cosmos, everything is in cyclical moments. Without this cyclical moment, there is no physical existence. This is what we refer to in the yogic culture as samsara. Samsara means something that is going in cyclical movement. That means it is traversing the same path again and again but makes you believe it is new all the time. So if you have a very short memory, you will see every time it comes you experience it as new and you're excited about it. But if you have a very long vision of things, then you see the same thing is happening. The moment you see the same thing is happening, you will want to change it, isn't it? It is from this context the idea of mukti or liberation comes up because you see that you're stuck in the cycles of samsara. So the same thing is going round. Why is this happening? Because of our identity with, identity with physical nature. Because we are so identified with the physical self that we are, now everything that we do also goes in cycles. Cycles means we are going round and round. You know in English the term, if I say you're going round and round, it means you're not getting anywhere. So sa the word samsara has been misinterpreted and gone to, into use in variety of ways. For example, in Tamil, if you say samsara, it means wife. <laughs> she keeps you going round and round. <laughs> I don't know how that usage came, but uh, today in Tamil language, if somebody says uh, my samsaram, you were supposed to understand it's his wife, not his cyclical nature. <laughs> okay, so Guru, now my question is that, do you think, like, like you said, in the scheme of thing and like in going round and round in this, in this cosmos, we, like somebody like me, I sometimes feel that the things that I want to f do and the things that I feel for, is, is it pompous us, for, of us to, to think that we can do something for others or, or uh, maybe, you know, like the spirit of… Y y if you want to do something for others, please be pompous, as pompous as you want, please do something because a lot needs to be done in this country. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, fine. Okay, so my, my uh, almost second last question. That's, that's good, isn't it? I'm telling you to be pompous. Okay, fine. I love being pompous anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sadhguru, um, I, I personally have um, read a lot of books about spirituality and I've been following Swami Vivekananda from the age of 17 and I never really felt the need of a guru. Um, until I was faced with mortality, I lost a friend at the age of 25 and, um, and since then I, I just feel that everything that I've done in my life or every situation I've been into and I've walked into, I've always held my head very high and I've always been prepared for it, I mean as much as I could. Um, and I just, I can't wrap my head around it and when I read your book, I didn't instantly feel that I would be seeing this day and I felt okay fine I've read Buddha I've read like you know you're one of those enlightened people yeah sure so <laughs> no I wasn't impressed let me tell you but then I read uh, <laughs> but then I read um, 
more than a life. And there is the mention of this yogi, uh, Swami Nirmalananda, who waited for you all his life, and, um, and, and apparently you were supposed to guide him to Mahasamadhi. Now, Mahasamadhi is something that I've only heard of in stories and in myths and all of that, like where you willingly walk out of your body because you think that's the best thing to do at that point of time. Um, now, that seems too fantastic. And um, I mean, looking at how our society that euthanasia has been being legal now and the kind of resistance, like when your wife heard about the process, she showed extreme desire to adapt to that and she acquired Maha Samadhi in the middle of like thousands of people. It's written uh, elaborately uh, in the book and Nirmala Nanda was opposed by the, the government. You know, he was not allowed to be able to take Maha Samadhi. The liberals. Yeah, because apparently they were like, you, you can't take Maha Samadhi. And so, so, I mean, don't you think like we as people, we have stopped to discuss death because shouldn't we be prepared for that day? And when I got to know that you uh, can, I mean, I mean, since then I realized maybe you can help me if someday, like, I'm not saying now, but someday. <laughs> But when the time comes, don't you think I should be ready for it? I should be dressed like this and be like, hey, come, let's go. What do you mean come? Who, who has to come with you? Like whoever, <laughs> whoever comes at that point of time. <laughs> so... Uh, why, why is it pushed under the carpet? Why don't we talk it's about death? under the carpet, it's just that. That's why I said, all of us, we may call ourselves Indian, but our minds largely have become Western because our education is like that and we, you, you just, you, you do one thing in Mumbai, you go and just look at people below their knees. You will see at least 45% of the people are wearing only blue denims, okay? I'm not against it. I lived in it at one time for almost seven years, eight years. I wore nothing else but blue denims. It was like a philosophy, not just a clothing. So today that number has increased in a big way. It's American working, workman's clothes. It's spread around the world. And because workmen wore clothes which were, because of work, it wore out, you know. Our pants would wear out riding motorcycles, it would wear out, we would put a leather patch and this and that. But now people are buying pants which are torn, all right? <laughs> Paying more for the tear, you also know. So, <laughs> why I'm saying this is, because of this, this imposition is not small, it's taken a huge footprint in everybody's mind. In this culture, we talked about samadhi. It's a very commonly used word, but unfortunately people think samadhi means uh, uh, it's a gravestone. No, samadhi means sama and di. Sama means equanimous, di means buddhi. If you're buddhi or your intellect becomes equanimous. When we say equanimity, we need to understand this. The reason why you're using your intellect so extensively is because you've been tra trained to discriminate between this and this, between everything and everything. And we create… intellect is the thing which creates division between everything. For us to function physically in this world, I must know here which is me and which is you. I must know here what is a chair and what is a floor. Otherwise I won't know how to operate. So for practical purposes life, essentially for our survival, intellect is of paramount importance, no question about that. But this discriminatory dimension, if I ask you, I, I will leave her alone, okay? I will ask you, suppose there is a choice between having a sharp intellect and a dull or blunt intellect. What is your choice? You must choose, I'm going to bless you right now. <laughs> sharp. So essentially, intellect is a cutting instrument. It's a knife. The sharper it is, the better it is. It cuts everything. Why is cutting important? See, what is the nature of science that we learn today? If you went to a biology class, for sure, if you did not cut a frog or a cockroach, at least a flower you opened up. If you open up this flower, you will understand so many things about the structure of the flower, how it functions, everything, but you will not experience the flower because by the time you're done with it, it's finished. So if I want to know you, I think I must dissect you. I've come with my scalpel. 
You think by dissecting you, I will know you? By including you, I will know you. By embracing you, I may know you. But by dissecting you, I will not know you, isn't it? So when, in, when you… the only instrument you have is a knife and with that you try to do everything. I must tell you this, that was a time when I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle. It seems uh, where is uh, uh, Burma Nirani, is he here? They're bringing back Java once again into the country, I believe. Well, I rode probably the SD motorcycles like nobody. I was doing around fifty-five to sixty thousand kilometers every calendar year, just riding across the country without purpose. <laughs> Uh, so at that time I was… I don't know whether I was in Madhya Pradesh or I was in UP, the whole night I've been riding. Early morning I come to a place and uh, I want to have some tea and rest for some time. Then, uh, you know, I always fix my motorcycle on the street by myself, but the… I thought I saw a garage. It was named uh, handwritten Mubarak Mechanical Works. I looked at Mubarak Mechanical Works and whole night I've been riding, I didn't want to dirty my hands now. It was a simple thing, I had to just tighten the chain, just take off one link and tighten the chain, that's all I had to do. I thought this guy can do it. So this young, uh, very enthusiastic mechanic came out and I said, uh, why don't you just take off one link and tighten my motorcycle chain. Then he came out, then I saw the only two tools that he had in his hand was a chisel and a hammer. Then I said, wait. Then I walked into his little shack of a mechanic shop and looked inside, there was no other tools, only one hammer and one chisel, with this he does everything. <laughs> Once he works on your machine, nobody else can work on it anymore, it's finished. <laughs> I said, okay, Mubarak, <laughs> you don't touch my motorcycle like this. So right now, a whole humanity has become like this. The only in instrument they have is a knife. With this knife they cut, it's an efficient tool for cutting. Now you want to stitch your clothes, you stitch with a knife. This is what has happened to the denims. <laughs> if you do everything with a knife, everything will be in tatters and it's horrible, isn't it? That's all that's happening to us. We are trying to handle everything with one dimension of intelligence that we call as intellect. There are other dimensions of intelligence within us which is completely unexplored. So samadhi means to get your intellect to a state of equanimity so that it does not interfere in your perception of what really is the nature of existence. Right now, the only thing that's interfering in your life is your thought process, isn't it so? If I ask you to sit and meditate right now, you think somebody next to you is going to poke you? No, they are fine. It's your own mind, isn't it? People say they're depressed, people say they're agitated, somebody is manic, somebody is angry, somebody is miserable. No, 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 all this is not happening. The only thing that's happening is your intelligence is turned against you. You're not getting it. You think you're suffering because of something. No. Your intelligence is turned against you and nothing else. You have a knife and you don't know how to handle it. If you have a knife and you don't know how to handle it, you'll cut yourself up. Do you need any assistance from outside to make yourself miserable? You're very efficient, aren't you? <laughs> if you're alone and you're miserable, obviously you're in bad company. <laughs> So this is only because, see we don't give a knife to a child's hand, not because knife is dangerous, simply because a child's hand is not steady. He could hurt himself or hurt somebody. That's what, that's what the whole humanity is doing and they're evolving philosophies after philosophies and talking about life endlessly with one instrument of intelligence called intellect. This is the buddhi. Samadhi means you brought it to an equanimity where it doesn't interfere with your perception of life. So we identify eight dimensions of samadhi. The first four are called savitharka, that means they have qualities of experience. There are different dimensions of experience. The next four are called nirvitharka, or there is no experience as such, but there is a certain different dimension of awareness. In this maha samadhi is considered the highest because your equanimity got to such a place where there is no distinction between there is absolutely no identification between what is you and what is your body. Because what you call as my body is a piece of this planet that you gathered, isn't it? 
Either you realize that today or one day when they bury you, you will get the point anyway. You get it from me or you get it from the maggots, it's up to you. Mystic or maggots is your choice. But you will get it one day. If you get it today, if you genuinely understand this whole thing that I think is myself is what I have gathered from this planet and put it here like this. What I have in the form of my intellect, every little bit of data is something that you gathered from outside, isn't it? What you gather from outside can be yours, cannot be you. Guru Govind Do Khade Ka Ke La